this is Hold Space, where we celebrate game changers on and off the court. And I am just ecstatic to be celebrating these game changers right in front of me today, all strong women in what we do. But before we get into exactly what we'll be talking about today, I want to go to the land acknowledgement. We acknowledge that we are on the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, the Wendat people, and now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. Hello, my name is Savannah Hamilton. I'm a host and producer here at MLSC. And today we're excited to be, to be discussing The Standard, Canada's premier network and advocacy platform that aims to address systemic barriers up to employment, advancement, and the inclusion of Black women in the sector of marketing. This past year, MLSE partnered with The Standard uh, to support and the NBA to support Black women in the sports and entertainment industry through professional development, uh, content, programming, and experiences. As a part of Black History Month coverage, MLSE is proud to bring a group of women together who are making great strides in their respective fields and elevating The Standard. I love that. Joining me today are participants, Tanya Phillips, the founder of The Standard, Senior Manager, Strategic Partnerships, and Right to Play. Suzanne Duncan, the co-founder of The Standard, Managing Partner, Integrated Sports Solutions, and partner of Fem Gaming. Lacey Carmen Johnson, manager of basketball advancement here at MLSC, and Shauna Morrison, senior director of marketing and operations at MLSC. I want to open the discussion of, you know, starting with topic number one, addressing and identifying the barriers. So, you know, naturally, I have to go to Shauna first for this. Um, she's going to kick it off, of course. Yeah, of course. You know that was coming. What systemic <laughs> barriers, what systemic barriers or gender biases have you, you know, faced in your respective fields? You know, what lessons have you learned, Shauna, from these experiences? And how do you apply these teachings to your position now? Um, hi, Sav. That's a, that's a great question. And I'm so excited to have this conversation with these beautiful Black excellence. Um, for me, I think that Black women are often the only, if not one of the only Black people of their race or ethnicity in the room, which I'm sure we've all been there, right? And so in those only experiences, Black women are far more likely than white women to, in the same situation, to feel sometimes like if they're closely watched or if their actions reflect either positively or negatively on others like them. And so it's funny because a friend of mine recently shared a quote from Candace Parker where she said, it's no longer enough to just put our heads down, get the job done, accomplish the feat. We have to unite to figure out why the barriers are in place in the first place. And so for me, I think that's what I try to do in my day to day, to try to be a part of that solution to help to break that cycle. Absolutely. That's a, such a great quote. And I, I do recall hearing that as well. You know, um, Tanya, I would love to hear your thoughts on this as well. You, you know, exactly, Shauna, what you said about being the one and the only in the room. And, and you know, we, we tap into kind of what happened last year with American politics with the Amanda Gorman and still we rise, you know, um, the hills that we're going to climb. And so being able to know where we fit into these spaces but then utilizing what power we do have to change the conversation. Um, you know, I was inspired by Bernice King, Martin Luther King's daughter, who uh, when we were celebrating Martin Luther King Day, um, we ta she talked about um, shifting priorities because the legacy of King is the intergenerational wealth of that knowledge and what we're gonna do with that knowledge, what we're gonna do with that power. We're in such a great space and time now to be able, people are listening. So we're such a great space and time now to harness our strengths as a collective um, to be able to shift the priorities to something greater. That's incredible. You know, I love what you said there. People are listening, but not just that. We have a safe space now to speak. People are listening to what we have to say because we finally feel comfortable enough to speak up as well without feeling, you know, something could happen if we do. Um, Lacey, I would love to hear your thoughts because, you know, as a manager of basketball advancement, you know, at MLSC, I'm sure you've had many barriers that you've had to face. Yeah, so I'm, I'm actually fairly new to um, MLSC and the Raptors uh, specifically, but I come from the college space in the States. 
And so that I, I've always been one of only like you walk in and the expectation is like, oh, well, Lacey will handle it because she's the mom, the sister, the aunt, the, the mentor for everyone, you know, whether it's I have to, you know, educate my white peers on X, Y, and Z or take care of our black student athletes and make sure that they see a face that is representative of who they are and you can support them. So it's always trying to be everything for everyone, but I'm really only one person and always trying to be that voice. And so when I actually started at MLSC, I remember the first time we got on a call with my team, um, there were four black women on the screen, similar to how it is today, like at one time. And I was just looking like, oh my gosh, I've never, I've never experienced this before. I've been working in sports for, I mean, almost a decade and a half now. And it's like, I have, I've just, I've never seen that. And I was just so warm in my heart. And I think I was like trying to like convey that information to them. Like, you don't understand like how this makes me feel and how we, you know, we kind of have that term now, like that black girl magic. And even though our supervisor is a white male, I mean, he's amazing. He's an amazing advocate and ally for us, which I know we're going to talk, you know, more about later, but that's important for us to continue to have in the room. Um, but those, those barriers exist, right? Like you're expected to be everything for everyone while still being yourself. But then it's like, but can you really be yourself? And how much can we do? And how far can we push? And, you know, those, those different sensitivities that we have to bring back as black women every single day. Yeah, exactly. Suzanne, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Really where uh, I see the greatest challenges, which is why the standard is so important and means so much to me personally, is that as you advance, you then really start to feel where there's even less seats at the table. And so whilst there's a big, and, and similarly, I, my career has been global, so I've worked in five continents in the world, the space gets really narrow once you get to um, the level of uh, senior director to vice president and above. And so that's why the standard has meant so much is because it was targeting the exact space and experiences that I had had personally. Um, but what I would say, and, and I attribute this to my parents greatly, is that um, my father, who happened to work for Dr. King as well, said to me, you are the world and society will try to define you Society will try to put you in a box and tell you where you fit. And so we went about traveling the world and my father would always point out all these children and he'd say, what do you notice? And I'd say, they look like me. And he was like, exactly, you are everywhere. So where you meet obstacles, go outside those obstacles. So what I challenged myself personally to do and what I encourage everybody I ever meet to do is to fish in bigger ponds. When your pond gets too small, go broad. And, um, and you will succeed in places and spaces. You, by definition of being a black woman, by being from another country, by not speaking their language, you, by death, you will succeed in ways that blow the competition away, that, that, will, that are infinite. And so then therefore, when you come back into these spaces that you're wishing to go into, nothing limits you, you're limitless. Okay, so like my heart's really warm right now. <laughs> right you just touched on <laughs> so many amazing topics I, like we could have a whole sub like <laughs> discussion on everything you just talked about you know going into our next question whether it's the workplace or not is there anything that you feel like you have to be extra sensitive about or aware of because you are a black woman i learned very early on about um consensus building and being very diplomatic and garnering feedback from others, even though you already kind of know the answer, but garnering the feedback so you let them know, you let them think it's their decision, if you will, um, so that, uh, because that consensus building is so important. To your point, if it was a white male doing this, perceived as a leader and initiative, and but if it's a black female saying this, we have to actually prove, you almost have to, um, show evidence and have data to back it up. I can't tell you how many case for supports I've had to do. I'm in the nonprofit sports sector. And even internally with, with um, working within organizations, you, you run the chance of um, having to build backup and evidence. And now I just do it naturally. It's because, because I've been doing this for 20 years, I just know if I'm going to state a fact, I better have the data and everything else to back it up because I know that that's how it's going to be perceived. So, being prepared with all the backup, knowing the space, and also the consensus building is what I've had to do. The little code switching does kick in 
you know, um, that's a that's a thing, right? And so you you kind of you try to blend in a bit, figure out and try to read the room. You have to read it a bit more because you're often looking at maybe one other person that looks like you need the the look. You know the the look, right? Uh, but then you have to switch into this business performance personality. So it kind of takes away a bit from your authenticity. I don't do that anymore now, but I have to say that is kind of how you had to start in in your career. Um, unfortunately, that was some of the circumstances. And now it's about, I think, the way the world is now, we have the chance to be brave, to your point. Savannah, being brave and being authentic, I think is trumping everything. I feel like, you know, especially in sports, if we don't have the science, the data, the facts, the stats to back up our points, where are you talking about? What is it coming out of? You know, but if we are also men, people don't question that as much. So Shana, but go ahead. No, I was just going to say that, Tanya, I completely agree with you. I've been in those situations myself personally, and it's a tough one to manage, right? But I think for me, what I try to do is I'm uber sensitive to my tone and approach, you know, as as uh, Sav, you said earlier, you know, when you when when we are, we tend to be assertive, right? Most of us are mostly direct in our approach, but at times that can be perceived as being aggressive or rude. Or there are moments when you know we are, I'd like to say, clear and concise, but you're often being perceived and being called the B word. Um, and so, as I said earlier, where you know, oftentimes when we are the onlys in the room and we are a reflection of others that are like us. We tend to be super and uber um, uber sensitive in a number of ways in terms of our day to day and how we approach things. And in the conversation, we're we're the one and only face there. I think the most important thing and, and advice I always give people is learn the language. You can master the language of the business that you are in. Learn it better than they speak it, <laughs> and then you will use language in the same way you may use tone to, you know, to to create the efficacy that you're looking for in the moment, right? Use the language to shape around it. And if you become a master of that, you'll be ahead of it. Like they'll look for where you were behind them and you're in front of them. I love that. Lacey, before we get to our next question, I want to know if there's anything that you've had to deal with in, in terms of being extra sensitive because you are a black woman in a workspace. Um, definitely what, what, um, Tanya mentioned earlier with the code switching, that was a big thing for me, um, early on, just because of my educational background. So I'm a black woman with a PhD, but I do not like make people call me doctor. Now I will drop it on you if we need to, <laughs> because we know how that goes sometimes, like how I walk in the room and I realize most of the time, like I'm probably one of the most educated, if not the most educated person in the room. And if I have to make you realize and understand that I have absolutely no problem, you know, letting you know that, but at the same time, I'm authentic in who I am. And so the code switching thing, like, I don't care about, like, that doesn't take away from the educational background that I have. It doesn't take from the knowledge that I have, and it doesn't take from any of the connections that I continue to build throughout my career. So it is what it is. I'm going to be a potty mouth. I'm going to say the things that I have to say, and you're going to be able, you're going to deal with it the way that you want to deal with it and that's fine with me um i've just come to terms with that and then the other piece of it the sensitivity nature and this is something even today i was thinking about like all oh, my hair is curly oh, okay i'm on a panel with a bunch of black women so it's okay like that's not something that i have to deal with but when i have been in rooms and i know i'm going into senior leadership meetings and it's all white people or white adjacent people i'm like okay, maybe I should pull it back into a bun today, a tight bun, not a, you know, poofy bun, or I, maybe I should straighten my hair. And I shouldn't have to think about that. We shouldn't have to think about that. But that is very commonplace um, in the industries, you know, that we work in. And I, I know we're getting away from that because, you know, natural hair and our braids and our twists. And I love just the eclectedness of what we look like right now on this panel, like the diversity of what we are as Black women. Uh, I'm proud of that and I love that I can wear my hair in eight different hairstyles and you know continue to you know keep it keep it moving yes like I love it it's the versatility for me um, but those are things that we genuinely have to you know keep in the forefront of our mind 
And I've had conversations with some of my, my white peers and like, oh, I wish my hair, you know, could do things like yours. I'm like, well, I'm sure you do, but I wish I didn't have to think about the fact that I can't wear my hair like this because I'm going into this meeting because it's gonna, you know, look, people might look negatively on me or they're not gonna fully take into account the things that, I'm, that are coming out of my mouth because they're so focused on my appearance. Mm. How big is the hair in the black woman community? I mean, black community as a whole, but like, it's something that I personally have been so sensitive about. When I got my hair done in twist recently, even to this style, I was wondering, is this gonna, you know, come out professional on broadcast? You know, will this be almost, I don't wanna say too black, but like, uh, you know, just the fact that I had to think about that told me that we need to see more of this on camera. And, and like, oftentimes when we do see girls who have their hair natural hairstyles or braids or traditional black styles, they are perceived in the media to be ghetto or from a rougher community and so it's not so we, we're slowly changing the perception of that but it's crazy how we have to think consciously about what does our hair look like going into this job interview or this meeting now we're gonna we're, we have so much good stuff to talk about so i gotta keep us honest on our time here a little bit so suzanne i'm gonna go to you first i'm gonna give you guys two questions each um you know what can the movers and shakers do to better reach out uh, to equity-seeking groups and become proactive allies? I think that the first thing they can do is, is uh, listen. So come ready to listen and come prepared. Those are the two things that I think of right off the bat. So for example, right now, people, a lot of the gestures and the actions that have happened have been very performative over the course of the last, what, two years, right? And so, and we're actually even entering a phase where people are you know, doing less because there's less attention and what have you. And there's there's a back to the place of like dictating, well, here's how we're gonna help you as opposed to what would help you? What would help your mission? What are the kinds of things that lead, ladder up to your strategic imperatives that, that we can support so you can be sustainable? If that's listening and then that's coming prepared with how we can help you. And so I think that's for a second, know that right now, some time's gone by. So anyone coming to the table not only needs to be prepared, but also needs to be prepared with the answers to what they've done. This isn't, the, time has passed. So what have you done? What actionables have you taken? Where does it show up in your organization? Show me, because there's been enough time. It's not like we're, you know, we're growing into that. We're doing better. <laughs> what have you done? It's that simple. Mm -hmm. oh, I love that. I love that. Tanya, I would love to hear your thoughts on, you know, what, movers and shakers could also do better to reach out to groups as well. Absolutely. And I think I, I love Suzanne's word with intentionality. Um, that's actually my mantra for 2022 is be intentional because lots of people like to walk, a t the, uh, lots of people like to talk a talk, but are they walking said talk? Um, and so it's really important that the actions follow um, what you're saying, uh, or else it, it's disingenuous and it's actually could be more painful and more hurt to, you know, marginalize and oppressed communities, um, by performing, but then you're not really actually doing it. So do the do, um, I think also too, is getting a collective. So noticing now, and I'm going to, I'm going to point back to Suzanne cause she's, she's actually amazing when she talks about it. Um, she talks about divine design. Um, high, greater good, divine design, right? So it's by divine design that we live in a society that systemically oppresses people of color because it wasn't designed for us. So we've always been in a space where we are the one and the only in the room. Um, and we also don't necessarily connect to each other. This is an amazing situation. You know, when we said, oh my gosh, if you saw four black women in a conversation, you'd be so excited. How is that not the norm? Um, how is that not more commonplace? It's by divine design through, no, sorry, it's by design, sorry, that these situations are happening because of the systemic biases that are happening in, in corporate Canada. Now we get organizations like, you know, the Canadian Black Standard and Black Talent Initiative and Black in Sports Business who are bringing all of us together um, because we didn't know about each other. I didn't know Suzanne like two years ago, you know, I didn't know Shauna and now, and, and Sav, and now I'm like, girls, let's, let's have it like Kiki, you know, like, let's keep going. Right. Like, <laughs> um, so once we get together, it's the strength of the, the collaboration and, and the collective 
because that's what's really going to move the needle. Um, when you're hearing from the diverse voices and we come together, what you also hear is the commonality, the, the thread that is consistent, whether you live in British Columbia or whether you're in Newfoundland or whether you're in Nunavut. The common thread of experience is consistent because we're Black 365. <laughs> <laughs> Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And Tanya, yo, I'm about to take this whole conversation offline. We can have a whole girl's night, grab some wine, and just go off, have a night. But um, Shauna, I I'm going to go to you for this one next. You know what? When organizations choose to commit to an inclusive culture, how can this benefit them from a social and economic standpoint? There's so many ways there, right? They're just to name a few. I mean, there's higher job satisfaction, there's lower turnover, there's higher productivity, right? And there's increased creativity and innovation. And I think that studies have shown that when you can bring together a diverse group of people and perspective, the results are far stronger, they're deeper, they're bolder, and they're far greater. And so for me, making sure that you have a collective diverse thought is ultimately a win-win for all. Yes, and, and I don't think people re recognize that enough. Like diversity is not just for the minority group. It's for everyone. Like everybody gets stronger. Everybody wins when you are covering the blind spots that you don't see within your own organization. Um, you know, Lacey, I'm going to give it to you to cap this whole thing off, girl. So here it comes. When organizations choose to commit to an inclusive culture, how do you see the benefit and not just economic, but also social? Uh, representation matters, like period, like representation matters. And so how many of us saw someone like us in a position before we got there? Very few, but we can be that for others. And we're tapping into different markets. I mean, even something like from a social media standpoint, anytime like I'm posting something that the Raptors are reposting, like I'm hitting a different market that the Raptors may not necessarily have touched because I come from a completely different background. I'm not Canadian, I'm American. I'm from Texas, but I've been lived all across the states. And so now I'm hitting so many different markets that like they never have. I don't have this massive platform, don't get it twisted. I'm no social media influencer by any means, but like things are continually getting shared. And when I got the job at the Raptors, I, I mean, if people were coming out of the woodworks just congratulating me and so incredibly proud because that's just not something that like folks have always seen. And so that the, the global impact of what can occur um, is huge. Uh, and then internally, you have folks who are trying to come up within the ranks and they've never seen you know, a black woman continuing to move within the industry. And so it's like, oh, okay, well maybe, maybe I can do this. Maybe this is a place that I can continue to grow and I don't have to go somewhere else to look for it because we can do it right here in house. And so that, that diversity of thought at the table, but then even away from the table, um, is just, it, it, it continues to grow and you're gonna propel, propel the organizations, um, not just right now, but for the long haul. Way to cap it off. Go yeah. ahead, wait, go ahead. I do have to say this, as an MLSE alum who was there way back in the day, it's amazing to see these faces, to see all of you, um, to see MLSE being intentional, to see MLSE, as Bernice King said, shifting priorities. Um, this, is, this is an example of how organizations can be future forward, because it is going to help the bottom line. It is going to reach bigger markets. It's going to benefit in so many other different ways. It's really heartwarming to see, you know, 20 years later where MLSE is now and showing up with all of these beautiful faces and mosaic. I love it. I and one thing to ask there, sorry. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I think it's also just important for us to, it's the responsibility is also on us, right? When we get to that level of senior leadership and we are the onlys in the room, it is so important for us to reach out and to provide that guidance and that mentorship to younger Black women and Black girls to give them that support that is required to get them there and to make sure that this is forward moving and there's no more only conversation. There is an array of beautiful Black faces in these conversation and making sure that we are sharing diverse thought and perspective 
and there is representation. Like Lacey said, representation absolutely matters. Absolutely. Listen, I truly believe that we are not crabs in a barrel, but we are the blueprint. And I want to thank all of our panelists you know, today for being on here and, and being the movers and shakers in this industry that we don't see ourselves in, but we've had to trail, blaze that trail to be in so that others can see that they too can do this as well. So thank you to Tanya, to Suzanne, to Lacey and to Shauna. If you want more information on the CBS, go to their website, www.canadianblackstandard.com or follow them on Instagram. That's right, the IG, at Canadian Black Standard.